the Institute Annual Congressional Series. This morning features John R. Curtis, who is the uh, Utah's representative to the 3rd Congressional District. I'm Matthew Brogdon. I'm the Senior Director of the Center for Constitutional Studies here at UVU. And uh, we're delighted, along with the Gary R. Herbert Institute for Public Policy here, uh, to have been asked to co-host this event with the Sutherland Institute. The Sutherland, the Sutherland Institute Congressional Series facilitates civic engagement and civil dialogue as our delegation members speak on a range of critical issues. Constituent engagement matters now more than ever, and these events offer unique, uninterrupted presentations that inform and educate. John R. Curtis represents Utah's 3rd Congressional District. Since being elected to Congress on November 13, 2017, Representative Curtis has worked on 15 pieces of legislation that were signed into law, ranging in diverse topics such as better managing public lands, combating human trafficking, reducing burdensome regulations on small businesses, and more. Representative Curtis serves on the Energy and Commerce Committee, including serving as the Vice Chair on the Energy, Climate, and Grid Security Subcommittee and Communications and Technology Subcommittee. Before coming to Congress, John was a small business owner and served as the mayor of Provo City for eight years. John has been married to his wife, Sue, for 40 years, and together they have six children and 15 grandchildren. I hope you'll join me in welcoming John R. Curtis. Thank you. Although the great thing about grandkids is it's now 16. And my wife left the house at 4 a.m. this morning to go see our 16th uh, little grandbaby that's just uh, a week or two old. They're the best. I'm so pleased to be here. Uh, so much appreciation for the Sutherland Institute, for the good people there, for the good work they do. Of course, for Utah Valley University and the, the role they play here in the Valley and in the state is so important. Well, let me begin. Did you hear about the man who was arrested for impersonating a politician? He was sitting in his office doing nothing. Americans aren't happy with the way Congress is handling its job. According, according to the July Gallup poll, two in 10 approved, 77% disapproved of their work. Many come to the hallowed halls of the US Capitol now, not to legislate, but to be activists, create viral moments and pass blame on others. This creates an environment that promotes government by crisis. Very few are willing to launch themselves into the process of running for a federal office, getting elected by their peers, and traveling weekly to sit in a room full of people who are waiting to attack you the, for, at the right moment, embarrass you, and taint your reputation. Our country needs effective lawmakers that will return confidence, listen to their constituents, and pass bills that benefit all Americans. Why don't we feel like we're getting these types of leaders? Today, I share with you 10 reasons that, in my view, lead to dysfunctional government. As you listen, please keep in mind that while each point is small by itself, the accumulated total of these and others that I don't have time to discuss today chase away the very people we want to serve and attract those who come for the wrong reasons. I also share these with you at the risk of sounding petty or unappreciative. I trust you know this is not the case. Serving in the 3rd Congressional District is one of the greatest honors of my life. Despite sometimes rough conditions, it's an honor to serve, and I'm grateful every day for the opportunity. Finally, the list is not ordered by priority, but rather by the thoughts as they flowed into my head as I prepared my remarks. Okay, you ready? Number one, we're rewarding the wrong behavior. Recently, a small group of Republican members used a parliamentary parliamentary trick to shut down all proceedings on the House floor. They gave no explanation for their action. They had no demands. They simply wanted to demonstrate their power to shut down the House of Representatives of the United States of America. Although we had all flown from our districts, no votes were taken, and all 435 members lost several days of work. Shortly after that, in a closed-door meeting of Republicans, one of my colleagues stood up and told us that his daughter was dying of cancer 
The previous week, he had left his daughter to come to do his duty in Washington. Imagine how he felt about these tricks. Sadly, yesterday, I received an email that his daughter had passed away. In the days that followed, few heard about the man who left his dying daughter of cancer. But the renegades who shut down the house floor were featured on the news as heroes, and they used the fame to raise a substantial amount of money for the already overstuffed campaign funds. In a similar vein, we all remember the 15 votes it took for the Republicans to elect their speaker. At least one of the persistent no voters sent out fundraising emails after each vote, bragging about he was holding, how he was holding up the process and how he desperately needed your money to keep up the fight. At one point, he even boasted he received everything he wanted and there was nothing else to ask for, but he continued to vote no so that he could keep the dollars flooding in. Those who play tricks, those who act like spoiled teenagers, raise large amounts of money and get the TV time. When's the last time you heard about a bill that passed in an overwhelming bipartisan majority? It happens all the time, but it doesn't make the news. If we want effective, hard work, what are we doing to recognize and reward it? To the media, I ask, are you willing to report on all the news, not just the news that generates revenue? And are you willing to spend the time to help viewers understand why something that seems mundane is really very important? To those of you complaining about ineffective government, are you willing to go, to the, go past the surface and really see what's happening in D.C.? Are you really willing to find out something good about your congressman and tell your neighbors about it on social media? Number two, we are unwilling to make elected office a good job. The mayor of New York City makes $258,000. Now, I know that sounds like a lot of money, but think about this. He has 325 full-time employees. He oversees everything from public safety, sewers, transportation, parks, and every aspect of New York life. By comparison, a CEO with those responsibilities and those number of employees, the average salary is $15 million. Where are skilled leaders likely to go? Elected office or the corporate world? So who are we left with? No wonder New York attracts billionaires to be its mayor. Now, please allow me a disclaimer. I'm very grateful for the tax dollar, whoa, that, pays my, that compensates me for my work. I wish not to complain, but point out a problem approximately one-fourth of all members of Congress sleep in their office because without appropriate reimbursement, they can't afford to maintain two households. Back in 2009, in response to taxpayers, we stopped any inflation adjustment to our salary. No change has been made in compensation for 14 years, and I don't expect that to change for many more. My first four years serving as a mayor of Provo I made less money than when I was a senior at BYU. I laugh sometimes with my colleagues that we pass laws against the way we're treated. In other words, we wouldn't let an employer get away with our working conditions. Now I get it. We don't want elected leaders profiting off their service. But the alternative is that we attract only the personal, personally wealthy or those so addicted to power that they don't care about the compensation. To those of you, and I hear your voices all the time, that fear that members of Congress somehow make money off their job, possibly by cheating or the notoriety or the celebrity they obtain by being in office. After all, President Obama made millions being in Congress, right? Let me say, first of all, just because you saw it on the internet doesn't make it true. And let me give you a quick thumbnail of the reality. Everything members of Congress and their spouses own Everything we make is publicly disclosed. I'm prohibited from earning money on any outside interest, except for my congressional pay, except for passive income. If I buy or sell a stock, my home, or make an investment, I must report it for the world to see. Every one of these moves is watched by a staff of lawyers that work for the House Ethics Committee. In addition to the Ethics Committee, the disclosures are studied and watched by watchdog groups, our opponents, and of course the media. As an example, I was one of four featured in a scathing news story this week. The headline read, undermining the integrity of Congress. Four more GOP lawmakers just violated federal law. And there was my picture. What was my offense that landed me in the article? 
the law firm that prepares my disclosures missed the reporting deadline by one business day. That's how tough they are on us. If a friend of mine in my life before Congress invites me to a jazz game, I need written permission from the ethics department to go with him. I can accept a t-shirt, but not a mill or anything more valuable. In short, pages and pages of rules exist to make sure we're not profiting from our office. Can it happen? Sure. Is it pervasive? No, not even close. Most of us have taken a considerable hit to income to serve. Are we willing to compensate our elected leaders and provide reasonable working conditions? It's not that hard and it's not that expensive. A good start would be to engage a panel of compensation experts who could quickly determine the amount of pay that is appropriate. Reviewing it several years, each several years and following well-established corporate guidelines for reimbursement. Number three, we like a good speech better than good work. It's not hard to point out a politician that was elected with no credentials other than a good speech. This is where we seriously pause and ask, how did George Santos get elected? He lied about raising money for the homeless veterans' dogs. He lied to investors. He lied about his campaign financing. He even lied about his name but he knew how to give a good speech. Think of it like a job interview. If you were going to hire a CEO, would you hire them only on the impression of the interview? Would you take everything they said at face value? I don't think so. Most companies would call references, maybe even do a background check. I was taught when I was hiring people to look for a pattern of success in an applicant's life. Do they know how to lead a team, build relationships, persuade? And have they shown they can get things done? I'm stunned at how many times I see someone elected with no regard to any success in any other part of their life. Unemployed, bankrupt, no previous leadership opportunities, yet they gave a good speech and passed out promises. I once had to let an employee go at my business and he responded, you can't fire me. No one else will hire me. Sounds like a perfect candidate for elected office. Why do we vote for people that no one else would hire? The extremes to the right and the left love this environment. No one asks for details. No one follows up on their promises. No one asks what committees they serve on. No one asks what bills they sponsored and passed or even which bills even got a vote. How do we fix this? Yes, the media needs to do a better job of vetting. Yes, watchdog groups can do better. But this one I'm putting right on the backs of each one of us. Voters bear the responsibility of electing good and qualified people. It's not enough to be swayed by a good speech. Look at the person and please look at the character of that person. Look for patterns of success in their lives. Elected leaders should, elected office shouldn't be their first success. Don't believe their opponents and don't believe the candidate. Look for facts. Okay, number four, we want symbolism over substance. What does that mean? I've often thought about an answer I gave in a town hall meeting after I was first elected. So will you sponsor a bill to fix this? I explained the reasons the bill wouldn't pass and all the other solutions I had that would fix the problem. But no, I would not introduce a bill that would go nowhere. The constituent was frustrated. As I look back on the meeting, I should have just promised to, to introduce the bill and gone on my way, but would have never asked any more details. During my last campaign, and while I was a Republican in the Republican nominating process, I often stood before a room full of delegates about like this. I proudly launched into the work I was doing, the bills I was passing, the committees I served on, and almost without exception, somebody would raise their hand and say, yes, but why aren't you more of a fighter? At first, I didn't understand what they meant. I was fighting and I was winning, but they didn't see it as fighting because I wasn't name calling. I wasn't stamping my feet and calling out my colleagues on social media. Voters need to decide what they want out of our leaders. From my perspective, I see a clear choice. Someone that tells you what you want to hear or someone that digs in and does the work that you want done. What I'm saying here is too often, voters want the feel good answer and not a hard fought lasting solution. Thousands of speeches are given knowing that they do no good except to please those back home. If you want better elected officials, we need to start recognizing real work and not fake work. Okay, number five, 
we want representational government until we don't. When we elect someone, we are trusting them to study the issues and make good decisions. I watched a mayor almost lose re-election because he wanted to put a freeway off-ramp that would bring traffic into a neighborhood. While it is true the off-ramp would increase traffic in a wealthy neighborhood, it's also true that many years before those homes were built, a master plan showed the off-ramp at that location. At that time, many years ago, leaders spent years studying traffic flows to determine what would be best for the city. The truth is that without the off-ramp at this location, it would be built somewhere else and that would increase traffic in someone else's neighborhood. The mayor had the perspective of years of research and what was fair based on previous decisions and what was best for the city. The neighborhood only had the perspective of what was best for them, and it nearly cost the mayor his job. Surprise, today the off-ramp is still not built. I had a similar experience with a road that was built on the west side of Provo when I was mayor. I attended meetings about the project for months, maybe even years, I knew the cost of the project and where the money was coming from and where the money would go if it wasn't spent on this road. I knew the traffic counts. With all the other mayors in the counter, county, I had planned this with other projects around the county and state at, and how we were going to use those funds. I even knew that President Obama had put a special situation in where we could fast track this through the permitting process, which would otherwise take years. I knew the long-term plans for the airport of expansion, and I knew that Provo High would be moved to the west side of Provo. Some of the residents didn't see what I saw, and they felt like the volume of the traffic in that area didn't justify the road. And they said to me, Mayor, why won't you listen to us and do what we tell you to do? Don't build the road. They weren't that nice, by the way. Regardless, I built the road. Within a few years, the airport had expanded three times, and Provo High had moved to the west. Guess what I heard when I went to their town hall and meetings? Why aren't you building more roads and faster? Let me stop and acknowledge that though the people have a right to, that people do have the right to question the decisions of elected officials. Electing someone does not give that person carte blanche to do whatever they want. In addition, elected leaders have an obligation to listen and understand everyone's perspective and to the extent possible explain their vote. In the end, however, representational government means we elect people and trust them to study the issues at a much deeper level than the average constituent, and then we trust their vote. In my job, every two years, you get a chance to tell me how well I'm doing, and if you don't like me, select somebody else. Are we electing men and women of character and trusting them to represent us, or do we second guess their every move? Number six, we tolerate bad behavior when their political philosophy aligns with ours and we don't question their motives. This point needs almost no explanation. And I'm going to resist the urge to bring up several examples that would cause quite a deal of controversy in this room. But I think this is the source of much of our political divide today. We seem to be willing to tolerate the exact amount needed to make sure someone pursuing our agenda is not taken out. Now, before I explain this further, let me share number seven which is the inverse of number six, we search for and jump on any flaws of those whose political philosophies don't align with ours, and we automatically assume, assume they are motivated by an unworthy cause. The Democrats couldn't tolerate Marjorie Taylor Greene and Paul Gosar, so they were taken, when they were in the majority, they took them off their committees. But wait, they didn't remove a single Democrat. Are you telling me that during that same period of time, no bad behavior happened on the part of the Democrats? As soon as the Republicans took control, we threw two Democrats off their committees and no Republicans. My work in the House is full of impeachments, censors, half-truths, aimed at destroying reputations and careers. Congressional hearings are often nothing more than five minutes of grandstanding. I had a gut feeling when I was first elected to Congress that I would be asked to take an impeachment vote. Huh. Little did I know I would have two votes so far. No doubt more are coming. As a matter of fact, I've been known to say that every sitting president whose party doesn't hold the House in the future will be impeached. And yet, somehow all the good guys are on my side and all the bad guys are on the other side. We need to be better at calling out bad behavior of those that share our, our politics. And we need to do a better job of separating what are human flaws within all of us and what are flaws so deep that someone shouldn't serve. 
Most important, we need to be blind when we call out bad behavior to our political views and what we stand to gain or lose. Number eight, we look at the we need to look at the body of work of our leaders and not only whims that seem important at the moment. In other words, the big picture. During the Trump years, my days were full of half of my constituents mad at me that I wasn't supporting Trump and half of them mad at me that I wasn't tougher on Trump. While it is true that Congress has an important oversight role, I don't believe the founders intended me to spend my days responding to tweets from the president. Several years ago, I was working in the south part of my district with my staff. We were four or five hours away from home, and we'd been working that part of the district for the entire week. Much of our work was culminating in a morning-long meeting with elected leaders from the county, the tribe, and the cities. In that part of my district, I literally have homes without running water and electricity. Navajo children were missing too many school days because the dirt roads were not maintained and washed out when it rained. That meeting served as an impetus to fix that and work on many other important problems. But that same morning, President Trump sent out a tweet that set the anti-Trumpers' hair on fire. Many in my district were angry that it had no response to the tweet. A response to the president is not a casual thing. It pulls me, my chief, my deputy chief, my district director, and my communications director out for several hours. Had we responded to the tweet, we would not have had our successful meeting. Today, I don't even remember what the tweet was about, and I doubt anyone else does either. But today, kids are missing less school because of an agreement that was reached that came out of that morning to maintain the roads. That day, the big picture was the quality of life in that part of my district and not the president's tweets. If we want better leaders, we need to judge them on the big picture, on their body of work and not the whim of the moment. As we're looking at the big picture, are we getting distracted by whims of the moments? Do we know the whole body of work of your congressman, or are you only looking at one vote or tweet? Number nine, our news sources are cable news and social media. As I flew back and forth between Washington, D.C. and Salt Lake City as a new member of Congress, I figured I would have balance by listening partly to CNN and partly to Fox. What I soon realized is neither of those channels talked about anything that happened while I was in Washington that week. They were talking about the latest rumor, and they were pulling a panel of experts together to talk about the rumor, and they stayed on, on that as long as it there was not the new rumor coming out. As a young freshman in Congress, I was presided, to, I was asked to preside on the House floor. We were debating over 60 bills on opioids. At the time, it was one of the most important issues in the country five years ago. 60 bills, the Republicans stood up and said, these are good bills, please vote for these bills. We'd like to thank our Democratic colleagues for their help on these bills. Democrats stood up 60 times and said, these are good bills, please vote for these bills. We'd like to thank our Republican colleagues for these bills. Pass the House in a near unanimous vote, pass the Senate in a near unanimous vote, and President Trump signed into the law. Imagine my disappointment to hop on the plane that week as I was going home and not even hear that reported in the news. How many of you heard about that? I'm often asked where people can find unbiased, accurate news. There is no silver, silver bullet, and it's easier to tell you where not to go than tell you where to go. But I have found success in a simple formula. Find a news source that is acclaimed for being non-biased. Rutgers, BBC, Wall Street Journal, BBC, and Bloomberg are good places to start. But know that everything you read has some bias. Never trust one side completely. Remember, there are always two sides to an issue. Get to know both sides. I listened to a right-leaning podcast called Potomac Watch by Wall Street Journal and a left-leaning podcast called The Daily by The New York Times. It helps me to see an issue from the eyes of those who see things differently than I do. If it's important, go deep and realize that most issues are not black or white and that the world is expert at putting up red herrings. Develop people you trust, but don't lean on only those that see things like you. And finally, cross-check all of the above. All right, we've landed on number 10. We too quickly forget our elected leaders are a reflection of us. Say what you want about election fraud or Russian interference, but within a few percentage points, half the country, 
wants Donald Trump to be president and half the country wants Joe Biden to be president. Come on, most of us have at least thought this if we haven't said it. Another Biden-Trump rematch? Is that really the best we can do? You seem to be heading 100 miles per hour into a presidential election where both candidates have been impeached and have been accused of serious charges. Who can forget the Trump-Biden debate where it felt like we had two preschoolers on stage interrupting each other and throwing insults at each other. Not our finest moment. But think for a second. If those two were replaced, replaced on the debate stage by two mayors that reflected the American people, would the debate have been any different? There will be many that hear this and think I'm pointing at them. Let me be clear. Our society is made up of many outstanding people who serve their communities, study out and vote and support good people. With that said, somehow we're not doing so well. We have mothers who won't talk to daughters. We have neighbors who seek to destroy neighbors with different political views. We say things on social media we would never say face to face. We tolerate behavior that would have caused our parents to wash our mouth out with soap. That's something we used to do. In a recent parade, Sue and I rode on a floral bicycle with two of our grandchildren who heard some in the crowd tell their grandpa to go to hell. How is that okay? We are the people that step forward and say, that is not acceptable. When I was mayor, I read all my social media comments every night. Usually I'd, I would seek out the negative comments and meet with them or call them. And almost without exception, I was able to have a civil dialogue. Today, if I read my comments, my staff would find me in a fetal position on the floor the next morning when they came into the office. How is it okay? to slander a name call behind a social media veil. Now, I'm an optimistic person. I believe in the greatness of this country, our founders, and the Constitution. I look back in history, and I can see that the country has had some dark moments, but we have emerged from every one of those better than when we started. Thank you to those of you who seek goodness, who serve in so many ways. I often think of crossing guards, who with almost no compensation or recognition take care of our kids on the way to school. There are millions of crossing guards symbolically among us. I'm grateful that Governor Cox and his wife are spending their political capital to improve civility. Years from now, I won't remember the governor's position on legislation, but I will remember his efforts to lead us back to civility. Thank you to President Nelson for the, one of the most impactful sermons in my life. Thank you to media personnel that don't gloss over the bad, but don't use gotcha tactics and also seek to find a good as well. If you haven't heard, tune in to Boyd Matheson. I suggest you do and replicate his approach. Thank you to those of you who give time and money to support women and men and women, not based on their vote, but on their efforts to earnestly endeavor to do the right thing. Thank you to those of you that look beyond social media posts or sensational cable news. Thank you to those of you who give me and my colleagues the benefit of the doubt. Thank you to family and to especially spouses who bear the biggest brunt of the negativity. And thank you to every one of you that looks for and finds the good. Last week, I was in Kenya with some of my colleagues. We saw malnutrition, corruption, and almost no infrastructure. Imagine this. The country has five inches more rainfall as an average than Utah's wettest, driest year. Let me get that right. The country has five inches more rain on average than Utah's wettest year yet they have no water storage, so crops go unwatered and populations go thirsty. I listened with pride to the U.S. Ambassador of Kenya when she reminded everyone that even on Americans' worst day, everyone around the world still wants to be us. At the conclusion of our trip, the members of Congress sat around the table and shared experiences. Republicans and Democrats in the room with no press, no social media, and everything agreed to be off the record. It was a magic moment the type of moment that happens more than you know in Washington and the type of moment the founders intended and one that I wish you saw more often. Thank you, it's great to be with you today. Thank you, Congressman, and thanks to, to all of you for, for joining us today. It's, it's my pleasure to have a brief conversation with you, try and drill down a little bit into some of the things you talked about. And our, our team will rearrange a couple things so it continues to look good for the folks watching on the live stream. Uh, so we appreciate everyone's patience as we transition. Um, I, I want to drill down at something you said. You you essentially took the approach of, of being very optimistic, especially towards the end, talking about 
There, there are things that should give Americans hope, things that should give Utahns hope. And I, I want to talk through some of that with you, but, but first I, I want to ask, when you talk about voters who seem a little bit more interested in the political fights or the, the barbs people trade on social media, as opposed to the, the, the hard, intensive, grueling work of advancing policy solutions, can you go into a little bit more depth? Why do you think that is? Is something different now than it was in years past? Is it different than when you were a mayor? What has seemed to lead to that change? Okay, I have two mics. Is this one? Okay, this one, I'll use this one. Last night uh, with my staff and my uh, state director, who's here, Lori, we sat in a room and, and gave constituents five minutes. And the nicest lady came in. I don't know, I'm guessing she was 80 years old. And she looked at me and she said, she listed this list of problems she saw in the country and she had in her hand an envelope from the Republican Party. Uh, it was unopened, but I know what was in it. It was a letter um, spewing yuck and then asking for money. And uh, she said, will you fight for us? Why won't you fight for us? And um, I think that comes from a real frustration with government and lives and what's what's happening in their lives. And they're, they're not able to afford what they could a few years ago. They're not able to pay their bills. They they hear the lies and the deceit coming out of from Washington. And their response is a, a fighter. And, and I wish people would stop and think, think of any other setting when you're trying to accomplish something. And if you go into it and you call your colleagues names and you yell at them and then you embarrass them and then you turn around and ask for their support with a policy or an initiative or anything like that, are you likely to get it? And, and so I, it, it, it troubles me that I haven't figured out how to, to promote myself right as a fighter um, in the way they view fighter. But I'm also not willing to go there because you sacrifice the ability to get things done by simply going there. As an anecdote to get your response to, a, a number of years ago, a, a former work colleague of mine who happened to be on, on the other side of the aisle, politically speaking, mentioned to me, you can always kind of tell what kind of elected official someone is if you ask this question, if you ask it of them hypothetically to, to say, well, do you want to make a point or do you want to make a difference? And and everything you're talking about is kind of leads to the importance of making a difference. I wonder if you can help, if, if you were to sort of give voters some guidance of Number one, why is that distinction so important? Important, but maybe more importantly, how can a voter evaluate a candidate for office, whether they're a new candidate or an incumbent, to be able to determine are they in it just to make a point? Or are they in it to make a difference? Help voters see how to make that distinction when they cast their vote. Well, uh, one thing that I mentioned in my speech is we're not. Um, well, let me let me start over. When I was elected, no one had any idea that I would be dealing with it, uh, impeachment, COVID, January 6th, um, on and on and on, right? So if they were electing me based on what I said about immigration, uh, fine. But what are they doing to assess how I'm going to respond in those things that we don't know are coming? And so that's kind of my point of electing people who have a pattern of success in their life, who know how to deal with situations that come at them quickly, who... Um, who you trust their character. Um, listen, on January 6th, my colleagues were caught off guard. Some of them came um, intending not to certify the election, and some of them came to certify, intending to certify the election. A monumental thing happened, and moments later, they were asked to vote. And you need somebody who can process that monumental thing in no time, with no staff, no, you can't call a helpline. You can't, right? You are there and you're making a decision. And so so what characteristics in a person's life will show that you trust them to do that? Some of those members of Congress didn't adjust to that moment and paid a dear price uh, for it, and some did. Um, and so how is somebody going to uh, respond to Ukraine? How is somebody going to respond to COVID? You don't know what's coming in the next few years. So let's elect people that show a pattern in their life that show that they know how to deal with these things. It seems that one of the pitches to voters is, is to convey the message that, well, if you embrace kind of this approach of polarization and fighting and sniping and those kinds of things, that that actually makes it less likely that your preferred policy solutions will, will become effective. So I wonder if you can 
you know, help if you were to speak to all all voters in your district, help them understand that. And maybe is there a specific policy issue that you can point to where you can say, we would be able to make better progress on this issue were it not for this political partisanship and polarization that maybe too many voters kind of implicitly want? Well, there's no better example than immigration, right? Uh, what do my voters want? They want me to stand up and and yell at Biden for what's happening at the border. They want me to to condemn my colleagues uh, for for what they're doing at the border. They want me to stop and they want me to say it's the most terrible thing that's ever happened. I think the question is, go a little deeper. What have I done to change the situation at the border? Have I been working with my colleagues across the aisle? Listen, you're not going to pass a good piece of legislation without votes from Democrats. And Democrats aren't going to pass. We just have that divided of a government. What am I doing to build relationships with Democrats so that I can get a bill passed? Have I been to the border with my Democratic colleagues, not my Republican colleagues, with my Democratic colleagues, right? And so, go, you know, instead of just saying, oh, that was a great speech, say, what have you done to advance the cause of better immigration policy in our countries? Do you have a bill that does that? And what are you doing to get that bill passed? Anybody can put a, a bill in that says, build the wall, right? Or a bill that says, let them all in, right? And then go home to their constituents and they say, I put that darn bill in and I'm with you. It's hard to get a Democrat to support your bill. What have you done to, to, to pull somebody from the, over, other, from the other side, built that relationship where they're even willing to listen to you? In, in our policy panel that'll take place as soon as we're done talking, we're going to dive in a little bit more into the issue of polarization with some great experts on the issue. And I, I wonder if you can articulate for the voters um, essentially what what can they do in, in their own lives? So, so you kind of see it in the realm of Congress, in this very political institution, kind of institutionally built to at times feel polarizing. But as polarization seeps into more and more areas of public life, and maybe that's to some extent why voters are feeling this way, is there any kind of word of advice or encouragement or, or optimism you can give to voters with respect to how they should respond to those feelings of partisan polarization that, that they kind of view towards their fellow voters? Yeah, let me go back to this mirror concept. I used to stand in front of town halls in Provo and people were grumpy with me and I would say it would always make them more mad. I, if you don't like me, I got bad news. I'm a reflection of you, right? And our elected officials are more a reflection of us than we are willing to admit. admit. That may hurt a little bit, but it's true. We elect people who tend to think and act like we do, right? Not every time, but generally speaking, that's, that's what happens. In a perfect world, we would be led out of this divisive period by um, a leader on top who knew and understood this. And I can think back in, in my life of, of great leaders on both sides of the aisle who, who could help us in this time. But when we don't have that leader, the only other alternative is a bottom-up approach. And including myself, I don't think enough of us are asking, what am I doing? What are my interactions like with other people? Am I starting a chain of, of goodness or am I precipitating the, what we're hearing from people that we don't like. Um, I, I, I know this will offend people too, but what I see behavior exhibited by those who hate President Trump that mirror President Trump. That kind of gets to the next question as far as the, the responsibility that voters have. And as you articulated this idea that, well, if, if, if we had a leader or maybe a number of leaders who could be that kind of grand aspirational unifying figure, that could certainly make a positive impact. But in absence of that, it rests on we the people. Is there anything that you have seen as a message to voters that kind of helps galvanize them to take up that mantle of responsibility of self-government in a way that can move us towards a little bit less polarization? We're still going to disagree, but more towards electing leaders who want to make a difference rather than just make a point. What message is effective for so, voters? So, listen, okay, since we're offending people, uh, I, I used to think when people got mad at me for things President Trump would do, it's like, why are you getting mad at me? You guys elected him, right? Congress didn't elect the president. And we have to own that that's where these people come from, from us. It's not Congress that picks the president. 
um, other than an oversight role, it's not our job to 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 tell the president what he can tweet and not tweet. It's the voters. So voters have to care about the things that matter. They have to study the issues, study the people, and cast a well-informed vote. It sounds simple, right? But you know we're not doing that. Thinking of, of specific policy issues in, in the realm of polarization, you identified immigration as one that is severely hampered because of the partisan polarization we feel. Is there an issue that is is actually gaining some traction? There's actually good momentum that maybe for, for whatever reason, it doesn't feel quite as polarized that voters ought to know about that. Hey, we're actually making some progress on this. Do you, you want a shocker? No. Yes. Climate. Um, th those of you that know me know I talk about climate a lot. Um, there is some really good bipartisan work being done on uh, climate, environment, and energy policy. We agree on far more than we disagree, and we're starting to actually realize that. The last question before we conclude, and you've been so generous with your time, and, and we're very appreci appreciative. Related to that, is there a policy issue that voters seem to not be focused on much, that the media tends to not cover much, that you wish you could say, hey, folks, this is a, an issue that you all should care about, we should talk about more. Is there anything that comes to mind that you feel like we're missing in some of our public discourse with respect to major issues that we should be focused on as a district, a state, and a country? Well, I, the one that comes to mind, it's, it's not fair to say we're not focused on it, but we're not focused on it enough, and we're focused on it only in spotty areas around the country, and that is the budget, uh, the debt uh, that we're incurring. The, I've, I've sadly been in too many rooms with my Republican colleagues who um, have made the case for more spending and support more spending. And I, I just think that's the, the one that's going to creep up on us. Uh, that's the one that's going to weaken our national security. It's the one that's going to weaken our financial markets and our investments and, and our income. And uh, there's not enough serious talk in Washington about spending. Representative Curtis, thank you so much for spending some time with us this morning as part of the Sutherland Congressional Series. And thanks to our partners here at UVU and the Center for Constitutional Studies. In my last remark, I'm going to give Governor Herbert a shout out. Yes. You want a model of how to do this right. Governor, thank you for your example to all of us. And uh, it's an honor to know you and, and uh, watch your example. You're somebody I, I try to model. Thank you. Thank you.